Okay, let us begin. I hope you're all sitting comfortably. And for those of you following along, we are on book four, which is page 603 in my edition. But the first chapter of book four, which of course is the second half of The Two Towers, which takes place pretty much chronologically with the first half. So we're jumping over now and we will catch up with what Sam and Frodo have been doing since they left the Fellowship in December last year. Uh, so if you remember, they left very uh, secretly. They disappeared when the Fellowship was in chaos and used a boat, crossed the river and disappeared off towards the east. And uh, it's just Frodo and Sam alone. And uh, we'll pick right off there. Well, Master, we're in a fix and no mistake, said Sam Gamgee. He stood despondently with hunched shoulders beside Frodo and peered out with puckered eyes into the gloom. It was the third evening since they had fled from the company, as far as they could tell. They had almost lost count of the hours during which they had climbed and laboured among the barren slopes and stones of the Emin Muil sometimes retracing their steps because they could find no way forward, sometimes discovering that they had wandered in a circle back to where they had been hours before. Yet, on the whole, they had worked steadily eastward, keeping as near as they could find a way to the outer edge of this strange, twisted knot of hills. But always they found its outward faces sheer, high and impassable, frowning over the plain below, Beyond its tumbled skirts lay livid, festering marshes where nothing moved and not even a bird was to be seen. The hobbits stood now on the brink of a tall cliff, bare and bleak, its feet wrapped in mist, and behind them rose the broken highlands, crowned with drifting cloud. A chill wind blew from the east. Night was gathering over the shapeless lands before them. The sickly green of them was fading to a sullen brown. Far away to the right, the Anduin that had gleamed fitfully in sunbreaks during the day was now hidden in shadow. But their eyes did not look beyond the river, back to Gondor, to their friends, to the lands of men. South and east they stared to where, at the edge of the oncoming night, a dark line hung, like distant mountains of motionless smoke. Every now and again, a tiny red gleam far away flickered upwards on the rim of earth and sky. What a fix, said Sam. Well, that's the one place in all the lands we've ever heard of that we don't want to see any closer. And it's the one place we're trying to get to. And that's just where we can't get nohow. We've come the wrong way altogether, seemingly. We can't get down, and if we did get down, we'd find all that green land and nasty bog, I'll warrant. Phew, can you smell it? He sniffed at the wind. Yes, I can smell it, said Frodo. But he did not move, and his eyes remained fixed, staring out towards the dark line and the flickering flame. Mordor, he muttered under his breath. If I must go there, I wish I could come there quickly and make an end. He shuddered. The wind was chilly and yet heavy with an odour of cold decay. Well, he said, at last withdrawing his eyes, we cannot stay here all night, fix or no fix. We must find a more sheltered spot and camp once more. And perhaps another day will show us a path. Or another and another and another muttered Sam, or maybe no day. We've come the wrong way. I wonder, said Frodo. It's my doom, I think, to go to that shadow yonder, so that a way will be found. But will good or evil show it to me? What hope we had was in speed. Delay plays into the enemy's hands, and here I am delayed. Is it the will of the dark tower that steers us? All my choices have proved ill. I should have left the company long before and come down from the north 
east of the river and of the Emin Muil, and so over the heart of Battle Plain to the passes of Mordor. But now it isn't possible for you and me alone to find a way back, and the orcs are prowling on the east bank. Every day that passes is a precious day lost. I'm tired, Sam. I don't know what is to be done. What food have we got left? Only those, what do you call them, lembas, Mr. Frodo. A fair supply, but they are better than not by a long bite. I never thought, though, when I first set tooth in them that I should ever come to wish for a change. But I do now. A bit of plain bread and a mug, oh, half a mug of beer would go down proper. I've lugged my cooking gear all the way from the last camp. And what use has it been? Well, not to make a fire with for a start. Not to cook, not even grass. They turned away and went down into a stony hollow. The westering sun was caught into clouds and night came swiftly. They slept as well as they could for the cold, turn and turn about, in a nook among great jagged pinnacles of weathered rock. At least they were sheltered from the easterly wind. Did you see them again, Mr. Frodo? asked Sam, as they sat stiff and chilled, munching wafers of lembas in the cold grey of early morning. Nope, said Frodo. I've heard nothing and seen nothing for two nights now. Nor me, said Sam. Those eyes did give me a turn, but perhaps we've shaken him off at last, a miserable slinker, Gollum. I'll give him Gollum in his throat if I ever get my hands on his neck. Well, I hope you'll never need to, said Frodo. I don't know how he followed us, but it may be that he's lost us again, as you say. In this dry, bleak land, we can't leave many footprints, nor much scent, even for his snuffling nose. Well, I hope that's the way of it, said Sam. I wish we could be rid of him for good. So do I, said Frodo. But he's not my chief trouble. I wish we could get away from these hills. I hate them. I feel all naked on the east side, stuck up here with nothing but the dead flats between me and that shadow yonder. There's an eye in it. Come on, we've got to get down today somehow. But that day wore on, and when afternoon faded towards evening, they were still scrambling along the ridge and had found no way of escape. Sometimes, in the silence of that barren country, they fancied that they heard faint sounds behind them, a stone falling, or the imagined step of flapping feet on the rock. But if they halted and stood still, listening, they heard no more, nothing but the wind sighing over the edges of the stones. Yet even that reminded them of breath softly hissing through sharp teeth. All that day the outer ridge of the Emin Muil had been bending gradually northward as they struggled on. Along its brink there now stretched a wide, tumbled flat of scored and weathered rock, cut every now and again by trench-like gullies that sloped steeply down to deep notches in the cliff face. To find a path in these clefts, which were becoming deeper and more frequent, Frodo and Sam were driven to their left, well away from the edge and they did not notice that for several miles they had been going slowly but steadily downhill. The cliff top was sinking towards the level of the lowlands. At last they were brought to a halt. The ridge took a sharper bend northward and was gashed by a deep ravine. On the further side it reared up again, many fathoms at a single leap. A great grey cliff loomed before them, cut sheer down as if by a knife stroke. They could go no further forwards, and must turn now, either west or east. But west would lead them only into more labour and delay, back towards the heart of the hills. East would take them to the outer precipice. Well, there's nothing for it but to scramble down this gully, Sam, said Frodo. Let's see what it leads to. A nasty drop, I'll bet, said Sam. The cleft was longer and deeper than it seemed. Some way down they found a few gnarled and stunted trees, the first they had seen for days. Twisted birch, for the most part, with here and there a fir tree. Many were dead and gaunt, bitten to the core by the eastern winds. Once, in milder days, there must have been a fair thicket in the ravine. But now, after some fifty yards, the trees came to an end. 
though old broken stumps straggled on almost to the cliff's brink. The bottom of the gully, which lay along the edge of a rock fault, was rough with broken stone and slanted steeply down. When they came at last to the end of it, Frodo stooped and leaned out. Look, he said, we have, must have come down a long way, or else the cliff has sunk. It's much lower here than it was, and it looks easier too. Sam knelt beside him and peered reluctantly over the edge. Then he glanced up at the great cliff rising up away on their left. Easier, he grunted. Well, I suppose it's always easier getting down than up. Those as can't fly can jump. It would be a big jump still, said Frodo. About, oh, well, he stood for a moment measuring it with his eyes. About 18 fathoms, I should guess, not more. Well, that's enough, said Sam. Oh, how I do hate looking down from a height but looking's better than climbing. All the same, said Frodo, I think we could climb here, and I think we shall have to try. See, the rock is quite different from what it was a few miles back. It has slipped and cracked. The outer fall was indeed no longer sheer, but sloped outwards a little. It looked like a great rampart or sea wall whose foundations had shifted so that its courses were all twisted and disordered, leaving great fissures and long slanting edges that were in places almost as wide as stairs. And if we're going to try and get down, we'd better try at once. It's getting dark early. I think there's a storm coming. The smoky blur of the mountains in the east was lost in a deeper blackness that was already reaching out westwards with long arms. There was a distant mutter of thunder borne on the rising, rising breeze. Frodo sniffed the air and looked up doubtfully at the sky. He strapped his belt outside his cloak and tightened it and settled his light pack on his back. Then he stepped towards the edge. I'm going to try it, he said. Very good, said Sam gloomily, but I'm going first. You, said Frodo, what's made you change your mind about climbing? Well, I haven't changed my mind. Well, it's only sense. Put the one lowest as is most likely to slip. Well, I don't want to come down atop of you and knock you off. No sense in killing two of us with one fall. Before Frodo could stop him, he sat down, swung his legs over the brink and twisted round, scrabbling with his toes for a foothold. It is doubtful if he ever did anything braver in cold blood or more unwise. No, no, Sam, you old ass said Frodo. You'll kill yourself for certain, going over like that without a look to see what you're to make for. Come back. He took Sam under the armpits and hauled him up again. Now, wait a bit and be patient, he said. Then he lay on the ground, leaning out and looking down. But the light seemed to be fading quickly, although the sun had not yet set. I, I think we could manage this, he said presently. I could at any rate, and, and you could too if you kept your head and followed me carefully. Oh, I don't know how you can be so sure, said Sam. Why, you can't see to the bottom in this light. What if you comes to a place where there's no way to put your feet or hands? I'll climb back, I suppose, said Frodo. Easy said, objected Sam. Well, better wait till morning and more light. No, not if I can help it, said Frodo with a sudden strange vehemence. I grudge every hour, every minute. I'm going down to try it out. Don't you follow till I come back or call. Gripping the stony lip of the fall with his fingers, he let himself gently down until when his arms were almost at full stretch, his toes found a ledge. One step down, he said, and this ledge broadens out to the right. Oh, I could stand there without a hold. I'll. His words were cut short. The hurrying darkness, now gathering a great speed, rushed up from the east and swallowed the sky. There was a dry, splitting crack of thunder right overhead. Searing lightning smote down into the hills. Then came a blast of savage wind, and with it, mingling with its roar, there came a high, shrill shriek. The hobbits had heard just such a cry far away in the Marish as they fled from Hobbiton and even out there in the woods of the Shire, it had frozen their blood. Out here, in the waste, its terror was far greater. It pierced them with cold blades of horror and despair, stopping heart and breath. Sam fell flat on his face. 
Involuntarily, Frodo loosed his hold and put his hands over his head and ears. He swayed, slipped, and slithered downwards with a wailing cry. Sam heard him and crawled with an effort to the edge. Master! Master! he called. Master! He heard no answer. He found he was shaking all over, but he gathered his breath and once again he shouted, Master! The wind seemed to blow his voice back into his throat, but as it passed, roaring up the gully and away over the hills, a faint answering cry came to his ears. All right, all right, I'm here, but I can't see. Frodo was calling with a weak voice. He was not actually very far away. He had slid and not fallen, and had come up with a jolt to his feet on a wider ledge not many yards lower down. Fortunately, the rock face at this point leaned well back, and the wind had pressed him against the cliff so that he had not toppled over. He steadied himself a little, laying his face against the cold stone, feeling his heart pounding. But either the darkness had grown complete or else his eyes had lost their sight. All was black about him. He wondered if he had been struck blind. He took a deep breath. Come back! Come back! He heard Sam's voice out of the blackness above. I, I can't! He said, I, I can't see. I can't find any hold. I, I can't move yet. What can I do, Mr. Frodo? What can I do? Shouted Sam, leaning out dangerously far. Why could not his master see? It was dim, certainly, but not as dark as all that. He could see Frodo below him. A grey, forlorn figure splayed against the cliff, but he was far out of the reach of any helping hand. There was another crack of thunder, and then the rain came. In a blinding sheet mingled with hail, it drove against the cliff bitter cold. I'm coming down to you, shouted Sam, though how he hoped to help in that way he could not have said. No, no, wait, Frodo called back more strongly now. I shall be better soon. I, I feel better already. Wait, you can't do anything without a rope. Rope! cried Sam, talking wildly to himself in his excitement and relief. Oh, well, if I don't deserve to be hung on the end of one as a warning to numbskulls. Oh, you're now but a ninny hammer, Sam Gamgee. Oh, that's what the gaffer said to me often enough, it being a word of his. Rope! Stop chattering! cried Frodo, now recovered enough to feel both amused and annoyed. Oh, never mind, old gaffer. Are you trying to tell yourself you've got some rope in your pocket? If so, out with it. Oh, yes, Mr. Frodo, in my pack and all. I carried it hundreds of miles and I'd clean forgotten it. Well, then get busy and let an end down. Quickly, Sam unslung his pack and rummaged in it. There, indeed, at the bottom was a coil of the silken grey rope made by the folk of Lorien. He cast an end to his master. The darkness seemed to lift from Frodo's eyes or else his sight was returning. He could see the grey line as it came dangling down, and he thought it had a faint silver sheen. Now that he had some point in the darkness to fix his eyes on, he felt less giddy. Leaning his weight forward, he made the end fast round his waist, and then he grasped the line with both hands. Sam stepped back and braced his feet against a stump a yard or two from the edge. Half hauled, half scrambling, Frodo came up and threw himself on the ground. Thunder growled and rumbled in the distance, and the rain was still falling heavily. The hobbits crawled away back into the gully, but they did not find much shelter there. Rills of water began to run down. Soon they grew to a spate that splashed and fumed on the stones and spouted out over the cliff like the gutters of a vast roof. I should have been half drowned down there, or washed clean off said Frodo. What a piece of luck you had that rope. Better luck if I'd thought of it sooner, said Sam. Or maybe you remember them putting the ropes in the boats as we started off in the elvish country. I took a fancy to it and I stowed a coil in my pack. Years ago, it seems. It may be a help in many needs, he said. Haldir or one of those folk. And he spoke right. A pity I didn't think of bringing another length, said Frodo. Oh, but I left the company in such a hurry and confusion. If only we had enough, we could use it to get down. How long is your rope, I wonder? Sam paid it out slowly, measuring it with his arms. Five, ten, twenty, 
30 ells more or less, he said. Who'd have thought it? Frodo exclaimed. Why, who would? said Sam. Elves are wonderful folk. It looks a bit thin, but it's tough and soft as milk to the hand. And packs close to and as light as light. Wonderful folk to be sure. 30 ells, said Frodo, considering. I believe it would be enough. If the storm passes before nightfall, I'm going to try it. Well, the rain's nearly given over already, said Sam. But don't you go doing anything risky in the dim again, Mr. Frodo. And I haven't got over that shriek on the wind yet, if you have. Like a black rider, it sounded. But one up in the air, if they can fly. I'm thinking we'd best lay up in this crack till the night's over. And I'm thinking that I won't spend a moment longer than I need to stuck up on the edge with the eyes of the dark country looking over the marshes, said Frodo. With that, he stood up and went down to the bottom of the gully again. He looked out. Clear sky was growing in the east once more. The skirts of the storm were lifting, ragged and wet, and the main battle had passed to spread its great wings over the Emin Muil, upon which the dark thought of Sauron brooded for a while. Thence it turned, smiting the Vale of Anduin with hail and lightning, and casting its shadow upon Minas Tirith with threat of war. Then, lowering in the mountains and gathering its great spires, it rolled on slowly over Gondor and the skirts of Rohan, until far away the riders on the plain saw its black towers moving behind the sun as they rode into the west. But here, over the desert and the reeking marshes, the deep blue sky of evening opened once more, and a few pallid stars appeared like small white holes in the canopy above the crescent moon. It's good to be able to see again, said Frodo, breathing deep. Do you know, I thought for a bit that I'd lost my sight from the lightning or something else worse. I could see nothing, nothing at all, until the grey rope came down. It seemed to shimmer somehow. Well, it does look sort of silver in the dark, said Sam. Well, never noticed it before, although I can't remember as I've ever had it out since I first stowed it. But if you're so set on climbing, Mr. Frodo, how are you going to use it? Thirty ells, or say about eight, eighteen fathom? Well, that's no more than your guess at the height of the cliff. Frodo thought for a while. Make it fast to that stump, Sam, he said. Then I think you shall have your wish this time and go first. I'll lower you, uh, and you need do no more than use your hands and feet to fend yourself off the rock. Though if you put your weight on some of the ledges and give me a rest, it will help. And when you're down, I'll follow. I, I feel quite myself again now. Oh, very well said Sam heavily. Well, if it must be, let's get it over. He took up the rope and made it fast over the stump nearest to the brink. Then the other end he tied about his own waist. Reluctantly, he turned and prepared to go over the edge a second time. It did not, however, turn out half as bad as he had expected. The rope seemed to give him confidence, though he shut his eyes more than once when he looked down between his feet. There was one awkward spot where there was no ledge and the wall was sheer and even undercut for a short space. There he slipped and swung out on the silver line. But Frodo lowered him slowly and steadily, and it was over at last. His chief fear had been that the rope length would give out while he was still high up, but there was still a good bite in Frodo's hands when Sam came to the bottom and called up, I'm down! His voice came up clearly from below, but Frodo could not see him. His grey elven cloak had melted into the twilight. Frodo took rather more time to follow him. He had the rope about his waist and it was fast above, and he had shortened it so that it would pull him up before he reached the ground. Still, he did not want to risk a fall, and he had not quite Sam's faith in this slender grey line. He found two places all the same where he had to trust wholly to it, smooth surfaces where there was no hold even for his strong hobbit fingers, and the ledges were far apart. 
But at last, he too was down. Well, he cried, we've done it. We've escaped from the Yemen Muil. And now, what next, I wonder? Maybe we shall soon be sighing for good hard rock underfoot again. But Sam did not answer. He was staring back up at the cliff. Ninny hammers, he said. Noodles, my beautiful rope. Oh, there it is, tied to a stump, and we're at the bottom. Oh, just as nice a little stair for that slinking golem as we could leave. Oh, better put a signpost up to say which way we've gone. I thought it seemed a bit too easy. Well, if you can think of any way we could have both used the rope and yet brought it down with us, then you can pass me, pass on to me, Ninny Hammer, or any other name your gaffer gave you, said Frodo. Climb up and untie it and let yourself down if you want to. Sam scratched his head. No, I can't think how, I'm begging your pardon, he said. But I don't like leaving it, and that's a fact. He stroked the rope's end and shook it gently. It goes hard, parting with anything I brought out of the elf country. Made by Galadriel herself, too, maybe. Galadriel, he murmured, nodding his head mournfully. He looked up and gave one last pull to the rope, as if in farewell. To the complete surprise of both the hobbits, it came loose. Sam fell over, and the long grey coils slid silently down on top of him. Frodo laughed. <laughs> Who tied the rope? he said. A good thing it held as long as it did. To think, I trusted all my weight to your knot. Sam did not laugh. I may be mu not much good at climbing, Mr Frodo, he said in injured tones, but I do know something about rope and about knots. It's in the family, as you might say. My, my granddad and my uncle Andy after him, him that was my gaffer's eldest brother, well, he had a rope walk over by Tyfield many a year, and I put as fast a hitch over the stump as anyone could have done, in the shire or out of it. Well, then the rope must have broken or frayed on the rock edge, I expect, said Frodo. Well, I bet it didn't, said Sam, in an even more injured voice. He stooped and examined the ends. Nor it hasn't neither, not a strand. Well, then I'm afraid it must have been the knot, said Frodo. Sam shook his head and did not answer. He was passing the rope through his fingers thoughtfully. Have it your own way, Mr Frodo, he said at last. But I think the rope came off itself when I called. He coiled it up and stowed it lovingly in his pack. Well, it certainly came, said Frodo, and that's the chief thing. But now we've got to think of our next move. Night will be on us soon. Oh, how beautiful the stars are and the moon. Oh, they do cheer the heart, don't they? Said Sam, looking up. Elvish they are somehow, and the moon's growing. We haven't seen him for a night or two in this cloudy weather. Well, he's beginning to give quite a light. Yes, said Frodo, but he won't be full for some days. I don't think we'll try the marshes by the light of half a moon. Under the first shadows of night, they started out on the next stage of their journey. After a while, Sam turned and looked back at the way they had come. The mouth of the gully was a black notch in the dim cliff. Well, I'm glad we've got the rope, he said. <laughs> we've set a little puzzle for that footpad anyhow. He can try his nasty flappy feet on those ledges. They picked their steps away from the skirts of the cliff among a wilderness of boulders and rough stones, wet and slippery with the heavy rain. The ground still fell away sharply. They had not gone very far when they came upon a great fissure that yawned suddenly black before their feet. It was not wide, but it was too wide to jump across in the dim light. They thought they could hear water gurgling in its depths. It curved away on their left, northward, back towards the hills, and so barred their road in that direction at any rate while darkness lasted. We'd better try a way back southwards, along the line of the cliff, I think, said Sam. We might find some nook there, or even a cave or something. I suppose so, said Frodo. I'm tired, and I don't think I can scramble among stones much longer tonight, though I grudge the delay. I wish there was a clear path in front of us, 
Then I'd go on till my legs gave way. They did not find the going any easier at the broken feet of the Emin Muil, nor did Sam find any nook or hollow to shelter in. Only bare stony slopes frowned over by the cliff, which now rose again higher and more sheer as they went back. In the end, worn out, they just cast themselves on the ground under the lee of a boulder lying not far from the foot of the precipice. There for some time they sat, huddled mournfully together in the cold stony night, while sleep crept upon them in spite of all they could do to hold it off. The moon now rode high and clear. Its thin white light lit up the faces of the rocks and drenched the cold frowning walls of the cliff turning all the wide looming darkness into a chill pale grey scored with black shadows. Well, said Frodo, standing up and drawing his cloak more closely round him, you sleep for a bit, Sam, and take my blanket. I'll walk up and down on sentry for a while. Suddenly he stiffened, and stooping, he gripped Sam by the arm. What's that? he whispered. Look, over there, on the cliff. Sam looked and breathed in sharply through his teeth. He said, oh, that's what he is. It's that golem. Oh, snakes and adders. And to think that I thought we'd puzzle him with our bit of a climb. Oh, look at him. Oh, like a nasty crawling spider on a wall. Down the face of a precipice, sheer and almost smooth it seemed in the pale moonlight, a small black shape was moving with its thin limbs splayed out. Maybe its soft clinging hands and toes were finding crevices and holes that no hobbit could ever have seen or used, but it looked as if it was just creeping down on sticky pads, like some large prowling thing of insect kind. And it was coming down head first, as if it was smelling its way. Now and again it lifted its head slowly, turning it right back on its long skinny neck and the hobbits caught a glimpse of two small, pale, gleaming eyes. Lights that blinked at the moon for a moment and then were quickly lidded again. Do you think he can see us? said Sam. I don't know, said Frodo quietly, but I think not. It is hard even for friendly eyes to see these elven cloaks. I cannot see you in the shadow even at a few paces. And I've heard that he doesn't like sun or moon. Well, then why is he coming down just here? Asked Sam. Quietly, Sam, said Frodo. Well, he can smell us, perhaps. And he can hear as keen as elves, I believe. I think he's heard something now. Our voices, probably. We did a lot of shouting away back there. And we were talking far too loudly until a minute ago. Oh, well, I'm sick of him, said Sam. Well, he's come once too often from me, and I'm going to have a word with him if I can. I don't suppose we could give him the slip now anyway. Drawing his grey hood well over his face, Sam crept stealthily towards the cliff. Careful, whispered Frodo, coming behind. Don't alarm him. He's much more dangerous than he looks. The black crawling shape was now three quarters of the way down, and perhaps fifty feet or less above the cliff's foot. Crouching stone still in the shadow of a large boulder, the hobbits watched him. He seemed to have come to a difficult passage, or to be troubled about something. They could hear him snuffling, and now and again there was a, there was a harsh hiss of breath that sounded like a curse. He lifted his head and they thought they heard him spit. Then he moved on again. Now they could hear his voice creaking and whistling. Cautious, my precious. More haste, less speed. We mustn't risk our neck, must we, precious? No, precious. He lifted his head again, blinked at the moon, and quickly shut his eyes. 
I hate it. He hissed. Nasty, nasty, shivery light it is. It spies on us, precious. It hurts our eyes. Is. He was getting lower now, and the hisses became sharper and clearer. Where is it? Where is it? My precious, my precious. It's ours, it is, and we want it. The thieves, the thieves, filthy little thieves. Where are they with my precious? Curse them, we hate them. It doesn't sound as if he knows we're here, does it? Whispered Sam. And, and what's his precious? Does he mean that? Shh, breathed Frodo. He's getting near now, near enough to hear a whisper. Indeed, Gollum had suddenly paused again, and his large head on its scrawny neck was lolling from side to side as if he was listening. His pale eyes were half unlidded. Sam restrained himself, though his fingers were twitching. His eyes, filled with anger and disgust, were fixed on the wretched creature as he now began to move again, still whispering and hissing to himself. At last he was no more than a dozen feet from the ground, right above their heads. From that point there was a sheer drop, for the cliff was slightly undercut, and even Gollum could not find a hold of any kind. He seemed to be trying to twist round so as to go legs first, when suddenly, with a shrill, whistling shriek, he fell. As he did so, he curled his legs and arms up round him, like a spider whose descending thread is snapped. Sam was out of his hiding in a flash and crossed the space between him and the cliff foot in a couple of leaps. Before Gollum could get up, he was on top of him. But he found Gollum more than he bargained for, even taken like that, suddenly off his guard after a fall. Before Sam could get a hold, long legs and arms were wound round him, pinning his arms like a clinging grip, soft but horribly strong, squeezing him like slowly tightening cords, clammy fingers were feeling for his throat. Then sharp teeth bit into his shoulder. All he could do was butt his hard round head sideways into the creature's face. Gollum hissed and spat, but he did not let go. Things would have gone ill with Sam if he had been alone. But Frodo sprang up and drew Sting from its sheath. With his left hand he drew back Gollum's head by his thin lank hair, stretching his long neck and forcing his pale venomous eyes to stare up at the sky. Let go, Gollum, he said. This is Sting. You have seen it before once upon a time. Let go or you'll feel it this time. I'll cut your throat. Gollum collapsed and went as loose as wet string. Sam got up, fingering his shoulder. His eyes smouldered with anger, but he could not avenge himself. His miserable enemy lay groveling on the stones, whimpering. Don't hurt us! Don't hurt us! Don't let them hurt us, precious! They won't hurt us, will they? Nice little hobbitses! We didn't mean no harm! But they jumps on us, like cats on poor mice as they did, precious! And we're so lonely! We'll be nice to them, very nice, if they'll be nice to us, won't we? Yes, yes. Well, what's to be done with it? said Sam. We'll tie it up, so as it can't come sneaking after us no more, I say. But that would kill us, kill us, whimpered Gollum. Cruel little hobbitses, tie us up in the cold hard lands and leave us. <laughs> Sobs welled up in his gobbling throat. No, said Frodo, if we kill him, we must kill him outright. But we can't do that, not as things are. Poor wretch, he has done us no harm. Oh, hasn't he, said Sam, rubbing his shoulder. Well, anyway, he meant to, and he means to, I'll warrant, will throttle us in our sleep, that's his plan. I dare say, said Frodo, but what he means to do is another matter. He paused for a while in thought. Gollum lay still, but stopped whimpering. Sam stood glowering over him. It seemed to Frodo then that he heard, quite plainly but far off, voices out of the past. What a pity Bilbo did not stab the vile creature when he had the chance. Hmm. Pity? It was pity that stayed his hand, pity and mercy, not to strike without need. 
I do not feel any pity for Gollum. He deserves death. Deserves death? I dare say he does. Many that live deserve death, and some die that deserve life. Can you give that to them? Hmm? Well, then be not too eager to deal out death in the name of justice, fearing for your own safety. Even the wise cannot see all ends. Very well, he answered aloud, lowering his sword. But still I am afraid, and yet, as you see, I will not touch the creature, for now that I see him, I do pity him. Sam stared at his master, who seemed to be speaking to someone who was not there. Gollum lifted his head. Yes, wretched we are, precious. He whined, misery, misery, hobbits won't kill us, nice hobbits. No, we won't, said Frodo, but we won't let you go either. You're full of wickedness and mischief, Gollum. You will have to come with us, that's all, while we keep an eye on you. But you must help us if you can. One good turn deserves another. Oh, yes, yes, indeed said Gollum, sitting up. <laughs> nice hobbits, we will come with them. Find them safe paths in the dark. Yes, we will. And where are they going? In these cold, hard lands we wanders. Yes, we wanders. He looked up at them, and a faint light of cunning and eagerness flickered for a second in his pale, blinking eyes. Sam scowled at him and sucked his teeth but he seemed to sense that there was something odd about his master's mood, and that the matter was beyond argument. All the same, he was amazed at Frodo's reply. Frodo looked straight into Gollum's eyes, which flinched and twisted away. You know that, or you guess well enough, Smeagol, he said quietly and sternly. We are going to Mordor, of course, and you know the way there, I believe, said Gollum, covering his ears with his hands, as if such frankness and the open speaking of the names hurt him. We guessed, yes, we guessed, he whispered, and we didn't want them to go, did we? No, precious, not the nice hobbits. Ashes, ashes, and dust, and thirst there is, and pits, 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 and orcs, thousands of oxes. Nice hobbits mustn't go to s s those places. So you have been there, Frodo insisted, and you're being drawn back there, aren't you? <laughs> yes, yes, no, shrieked Gollum. Once, by accident it was, wasn't it, precious? Yes, by accident. But we won't go back. No, no. Then suddenly his voice and language changed, and he sobbed in his throat and spoke but not to them. Leave me alone. You hurt me. My poor hands. I, we, I don't want to come back. I can't find it. I'm tired. I, we can't find it. No, nowhere. They're always awake. Dwarves, men, elves. Oh, terrible elves with bright eyes. I can't find it! Ah! He got up and clenched his long hand into a bony, fleshless knot, shaking it towards the east. We won't! He cried. Not for you! Then he collapsed again. <laughs> he whimpered with his face to the ground. Don't look at us. Go away. Go to sleep. He will not go away, or go to sleep at your command, Smeagol," said Frodo. But if you really wish to be free of him again, then you must help me. And that, I fear, means finding us a path towards him. But you need not go all the way, not beyond the gates of his land. Gollum sat up again and looked at him under his eyelids. <laughs> He's over there. He cackled, always there. Orcs will take you all the way. 
easy to find orcs east of the river. Don't ask Smeagol. Poor, poor Smeagol. He went away long ago. They took his precious and he's, he's, he's lost now. Perhaps we'll find him again if you come with us, said Frodo. No, no, never. He's lost his precious, said Gollum. Get up, said Frodo. Gollum stood up and backed away against the cliff. Now, said Frodo, can you find a path easier by day or by night? We are tired, but if you choose the night, we will start tonight. The big lights hurt our eyes, they do. Gollum whined. Not under the white face. Not yet. It will go behind the hills soon. Yes, rest a bit first. Nice hobbits. Then sit down, said Frodo, and don't move. The hobbits seated themselves beside him, one on either side, with their backs to the stony wall, resting their legs. There was no need for any arrangement by word. They knew they must not sleep for a moment. Slowly the moon went by. Shadows fell down from the hills, and all grew dark before them. The stars grew thick and bright in the sky above. No one stirred. Gollum sat with his legs drawn up, knees under chin, flat hands and feet splayed on the ground, his eyes closed, but he seemed tense, as if thinking or listening. Frodo looked across at Sam. Their eyes met, and they understood. They relaxed, leaning their heads back and shutting their eyes, or seeming to. Soon the sound of their soft breathing could be heard. Gollum's hands twitched a little. Hardly perceptibly, his head moved to the left and the right, and first one eye and then the other opened a slit. The hobbits made no sign. Suddenly, with startling agility and speed, straight off the ground with a jump like a grasshopper or a frog, Gollum bounded forward into the darkness. But that was just what Frodo and Sam had expected. Sam was on him before he had gone two paces after his spring. Frodo, coming behind, grabbed his leg and threw him. Your rope might prove useful again, Sam, he said. Sam got out the rope. And where were you off to in the cold, hard lands, Mr. Gollum? He growled. We wanders, I. We wanders. Well, to find some of your orc friends, I'll warrant. Oh, well, you nasty, treacherous creature. It's round your neck this rope ought to go, and a tight noose, too. Gollum lay quiet and tried no further tricks. He did not answer Sam, but gave him a swift, venomous look. All we need is something to keep a hold on him, said Frodo. We want him to walk, so it's no good tying his legs or, or his arms. He seems to use those nearly as much. Tie one end to his ankle and keep a grip on the other end. He stood over Gollum while Sam tied the knot. The result surprised them both. Gollum began to scream, a thin, tearing sound very horrible to hear. He writhed and tried to get his mouth to his ankle and bite the rope. He kept on screaming. At last Frodo was convinced that he really was in pain, but it could not be from the knot. He examined it and found that it was not too tight, indeed hardly tight enough. Sam was gentler than his words. What's the matter with you? He said. Well, if you try to run away, you must be tied. But we don't wish to hurt you. It hurts us. It hurts us, hissed Gollum. It freezes, it bites. Elves twisted it, cursed them. Nasty, cruel hobbits is. It's why we tries to escape. Of course, it is precious. We guess they were cruel hobbits. They visit elves is for yourselves with bright eyes. Take it off us, it hurts us. No, I will not take it off you, said Frodo. Not unless... He paused a moment in thought. Not unless there is any promise you can make that I can trust. We will swear to do what he wants, yes, yes, said Gollum, still twisting and grabbing at his ankle. It hurts us. Swear, said Frodo. <laughs> 
me go? said Gollum suddenly and clearly, opening his eyes wide and staring at Frodo with a strange light. Smeagol will swear on the precious. Frodo drew himself up, and again Sam was startled by his words and his stern voice. On the precious? How dare you? he said. Think! One ring to rule them all, and in the darkness bind them. Would you commit your promise to that, Smeagol? It will hold you. But it is more treacherous than you are. It may twist your words. Beware. Gollum cowered. On the precious, on the precious, he repeated. And what would you swear? asked Gollum. <laughs> to be very, very good, said Gollum. And then, crawling to Frodo's feet, he groveled before him, whispering hoarsely. A shudder ran over him, as if the words shook his very bones with fear. <laughs> Smeagol will swear never, never to let him have it, never. Smeagol will save it, but he must swear on the precious. No, not on it, said Frodo, looking down at him with stern pity. All you wish is to see it and touch it if you can, though you know it would drive you mad. Not on it. Swear by it if you will, for you know where it is. You know, Smeagol, it is before you. For a moment it appeared to Sam that his master had grown and Gollum had shrunk. A tall, stern shadow, a mighty lord, who hid his brightness in grey cloud, and at his feet a little whining dog. Yet the two were in some way akin and not alien. They could reach one another's minds. Gollum raised himself and began pawing at Frodo, fawning at his knees. Down, down, said Frodo. Now speak your promise. We promise, yes, I promise, said Gollum. I will serve the master of the precious. Good master, good Gollum. Suddenly, he began to weep and bite at his ankle again. Take the rope off, Sam, said Frodo. Reluctantly, Sam obeyed. At once, Gollum got up and began prancing about like a whipped cur whose master has patted it. From that moment, a change, which lasted for some time, came over him. He spoke with less hissing and whining, and he spoke to his companions direct, not to his precious self. He would cringe and flinch if they stepped near him or made any sudden movement, and he avoided the touch of their elven cloaks. But he was friendly, and indeed pitifully anxious to please. He would cackle with laughter and caper if any jest was made, or even if Frodo spoke kindly to him, and weep if Frodo rebuked him. Sam said little to him of any sort. He suspected him more deeply than ever, and if possible, liked the new Gollum, the Smeagol, less than the old. Well, Gollum, or whatever it is we're to call you, he said, well, now for it. The moon's gone, the night's going. We'd better start. Oh, yes, yes, agreed Gollum, skipping about. Off we go. There's only one way across between the north end and the south end. I found it, I did. Orcs don't use it. Orcs don't know it. Orcs don't cross the marshes. They go round for miles and miles. Very lucky you came this way. Very lucky you found Smeagol. Yes, follow Smeagol. He took a few steps away and looked back inquiringly, like a dog inviting them for a walk. Wait a bit, Gollum, cried Sam. I'm not too far ahead now. I'm going to be at your tail, and I've got the rope handy. No, no, said Gollum. Smeagol promised. In the deep of night, under hard, clear stars, they set off. Gollum led them back northward for a while along the way they had come. Then he slanted to the right, away from the steep edge of the Emin Muil, down the broken stony slopes towards the vast fens below. They faded swiftly and softly into the darkness, over all the leagues of waste before the gates of Mordor. There was a black silence.
And we'll pause there for a break. We will continue in about 10 minutes. Okay, let's recommence with the next chapter. 
and we will carry on where we left off in the same half of the two towers. Gollum moved quickly, with his head and neck thrust forward, often using his hands as well as his feet. Frodo and Sam were hard put to it to keep up with him, but he seemed no longer to have any thought of escaping, and if they fell behind, he would turn and wait for them. After a time, he brought them to the brink of a narrow gully that they had struck before, but they were now further from the hills. Here it is, he cried. There's a way down inside, yes. Now we follows it. Out, out, away over there. He pointed south and east towards the marshes. The reek of them came to their nostrils, heavy and foul, even in the cool night air. Gollum cast up and down along the brink, and at length he called to them. Here, we can get down here. Smeagol went this way once. I went this way, hiding from orcs. He led the way, and following him, the hobbits climbed down into the gloom. It was not difficult, for the rift was at this point only some fifteen feet deep and about a dozen across. There was running water at the bottom. It was in fact the bed of one of the many small rivers that trickled down from the hills to feed the stagnant pools and mires beyond. Gollum turned to the right, southward more or less, and splashed along with his feet in the shallow, stony stream. He seemed greatly delighted to feel the water and chuckled to himself, sometimes even croaking in a sort of song. <laughs> the cold, hard lands, they bite our hands, they gnaws our feet, the rocks and stones are like old bones, all bare of meat. But stream and pool is wet and cool, so nice for feet. And now we wish, ha, what does we wish? He said, looking sidelong at the hobbits. <laughs> we'll tell you, he croaked. He guessed it long ago. Baggins guessed it. A glint came into his eyes, and Sam, catching the gleam in the darkness, thought it far from pleasant. Alive without breath, as cold as death, never thirsting, never drinking, clad in mail, never clinking, drowns on dry land, thinks an island is a mountain, thinks a fountain is a puff of air, so sleek, so fair, what a joy to meet, we only wish to catch a fish so juicy sweet. These words only made more pressing to Sam's mind a problem that had been troubling him from the moment when he understood that his master was going to adopt Gollum as a guide. The problem of food. It did not occur to him that his master might also have thought of it, but he supposed Gollum had. Indeed, how had Gollum kept himself in all his lonely wandering? Not too well, thought Sam. We looks fair famished. Oh, not too dainty to try what hobbit tastes like, if there ain't no fish, I'll wager. Oh, supposing he could catch us napping. Well, he won't. Not Sam Gamgee, for one. They stumbled along in the dark, winding gully for a long time, or so it seemed to the tired feet of Frodo and Sam. The gully turned eastward, and as they went on it broadened and got gradually shallower. At last the sky above grew faint with the first grey of morning. Gollum had shown no signs of tiring, but now he looked up and halted. Day is near, he whispered, as if day was something that might overhear him and spring on him. Smeek, I will stay here. I will stay here, and the yellow face won't see me. Well, we should be glad to see the sun, said Frodo. But we will stay here. We are too tired to go any further at present. You are not wise to be glad of the yellow face, said Gollum. It shows you up 
Nice, sensible hobbits stay with Smeeko. Orcs, nasty things are about. They can see a long way. Stay and hide with me. The three of them settled down to rest at the foot of the rocky wall of the gully. It was not much more than a tall man's height now, and at its base there were wide, flat shelves of dry stone. The water ran in a channel on the other side. Frodo and Sam sat on one of the plats, resting their backs. Gollum paddled and scrabbled in the stream. We must take a little food, said Frodo. Are you hungry, Smeagol? We have very little to share, but we will spare you what we can. At the word hungry, a greenish light was kindled in Gollum's pale eyes, and they seemed to protrude further than ever from his thin, sickly face. For a moment, he relapsed into his old Gollum manner. <clears throat> we are famished. Yes, famished. We are precious, he said. What is it they eat? Have they nice fishes? His tongue lolled out between his sharp yellow teeth, licking his colourless lips. No, we've got no fish, said Frodo. We have only got this. He held up a wafer of lembas. And water, if the water here is fit to drink. Yes, yes, nice water, said Gollum. Drink it, drink it while we can. But what is it they've got, precious? Is it crunchable? Is it tasty? Frodo broke off a portion of the wafer and handed it to him on its leaf wrapping. Gollum sniffed at the leaf and his face changed. A spasm of disgust came over it and a hint of his old malice. <laughs> Smeagol smells it, he said. Leaves out of elf country. Ah, they stinks. He climbed in those trees and he couldn't wash the smell off his hands, my nice hands. Dropping the leaf, he took a corner of the lembas and nibbled it. He spat and a fit of coughing shook him. <coughs> no! He spluttered. You tried to choke poor Smeagol. Dust and ashes, he can't eat that. He must starve. But Smeagol doesn't mind. Nice hobbits, Smeagol has promised. He will starve. He can't eat hobbits food. He will starve. Poor thin Smeagol. I'm sorry, said Frodo, but I can't help you, I'm afraid. I, I think this food would do you good if you would try. Uh, perhaps you can't even try. Not yet, anyway. The hobbits munched their lembas in silence. Sam thought that it tasted far better somehow than it had for a good while. Gollum's behaviour had made him attend to its flavour again. But he did not feel comfortable. Gollum watched every morsel from hand to mouth, like an expectant dog by a diner's chair. Only when they had finished and were preparing to rest was he apparently convinced that they had no hidden dainties that he could share in. Then he went and sat by himself a few paces away and whimpered a little. Oh, look here, Sam whispered to Frodo, not too softly. He did not really care whether Gollum heard him or not. We've got to get some sleep. We're not both together with that hungry villain nigh. Promise or no promise. Smeagol or Gollum, he won't change his habits in a hurry, I'll warrant. You go to sleep, Mr Frodo, and I'll call you when I can't keep my eyelids propped up. And turn and turn about, same as before, while he's loose. Oh, perhaps you're right, Sam, said Frodo, speaking openly. There is a change in him, but just what kind of a change and... How deep, I'm not sure yet. Oh, seriously, though, I don't think there is any need for fear at present. Still, watch if you wish. Give me about two hours, not more, and then call me. So tired was Frodo that his head fell forward on his breast, and he slept almost as soon as he had spoken the words. Gollum seemed no longer to have any fears. He curled up and went quickly to sleep, quite unconcerned. Presently, his breath was hissing softly through his clenched teeth, but he lay still as stone. After a while, fearing that he would drop off himself, if he sat listening to his two companions breathing, Sam got up and gently prodded Gollum. His hands uncurled and twitched, but he made no other movement. 
Sam bent down and said, fish, close to his ear. But there was no response, not even a catch in Gollum's breathing. Sam scratched his head. Must really be asleep, he muttered. And if I was like Gollum, he wouldn't wake up never again. He restrained the thoughts of his sword and the rope that sprang to his mind and went and sat down by his master. When he woke up, the sky above was dim, not lighter but darker than when they had breakfasted. Sam leapt to his feet, not least from his own feeling of vigour and hunger. He suddenly understood that he had slept the daylight away, nine hours at least. Frodo was still fast asleep, lying now stretched on his side. Gollum was not to be seen. Various reproachful names for himself came to Sam's mind, drawn from the gaffer's large paternal word hoard. Then it also occurred to him that his master had been right. There had for the present been nothing to guard against. They were at any rate both alive and unthrottled. Oh, poor wretch, he said half remorsefully. Well, now I wonder where he's got to. Not far, not far, said a voice above him. He looked up and saw the shape of Gollum's large head and ears against the evening sky. Oh, here, what are you doing? cried Sam, his suspicions coming back as soon as he saw that shape. Some Gollum is hungry, said Gollum. Be back soon. Well, come back now, shouted Sam. Oh, hi, come back. But Gollum had vanished. Frodo woke at the sound of Sam's shout and sat up, rubbing his eyes. Oh, hello, he said. Anything wrong? What's the time? Oh, I don't know, said Sam. Well, after sundown, I reckon. Well, and he's gone off. Who oh, says he's hungry? Oh, don't worry, said Frodo. There's no help for it. And he'll come back, you'll see. The promise will hold yet a while, and he won't leave his precious anyway. Frodo made light of it when he learned that they had slept soundly for hours with Gollum and a very hungry Gollum, too, loose beside them. Don't think of any of your gaffer's hard names, he said. You were worn out, and it has turned out well. We are now both rested, and we have a hard road ahead, the worst road of all. Well, about the food, said Sam. Well, how long is it going to take us to do this job? And when it's done, what are we going to do then? Well, this way bread keeps you on your legs wonderful way, although it doesn't satisfy the innards proper, as you might say. Not to my feeling, anyhow, meaning no disrespect to them that made it. But you have to eat some of it every day, and it doesn't grow. I reckon we've got enough to last, say, three weeks or so, and that with a tight belt and a light tooth, mind you. We've been a bit free with it so far. I don't know how long it will take to... Uh, to finish, said Frodo. We were miserably delayed in the hills, but... Oh, Sam, my scamgy, my dear hobbit. Indeed, Sam, my dearest hobbit, friend of friends. I do not think we need give thought to what comes after that, to do the job as you put it. What hope is there ever that we shall? And if we do, who knows what will come of that? If the one goes into the fire and we are at hand? I ask you, Sam, are we ever likely to need bread again? I think not. If we can nurse our limbs to bring us to Mount Doom, that's all we can do. More than I can, I begin to feel. Sam nodded silently. He took his master's hand and bent over it. He did not kiss it, though his tears fell upon it. Then he turned away, drew his sleeve over his nose, and got up and stamped about, trying to whistle and saying between the efforts, Where's that dratted creature? It was actually not long before Gollum returned. But he came so quietly that they did not hear him till he stood before them. His fingers and face were soiled with black mud. He was still chewing and slavering. What he was chewing they did not ask or like to think. Worms or beetles or something slimy out of holes, thought Sam. Poor oh, the nasty creature, poor wretch. Gollum said nothing to them until he had drunk deeply and washed himself in the stream. 
Then he came up to them, licking his lips. Better now, he said. Are we rested? Ready to go on? Nice hobbits. They sleep beautifully. Trust me, doll, now? Very, very good. The next stage of their journey was much the same as the last. As they went on, the gully became ever shallower and the slope of its floor more gradual. Its bottom was less stony and more earthy, and slowly its sides dwindled to mere banks. It began to wind and wander. That night drew to its end, but clouds were now over moon and star, and they knew of the coming of day only by the slow spreading of the thin grey light. In a chill hour they came to the end of the watercourse. The banks became moss-grown mounds. Over the last shelf of rotting stone, the stream gurgled and fell down into a brown bog and was lost. Dry reeds hissed and rattled, though they could feel no wind. On either side and in front, wide fens and mires now lay, stretching away southward and eastward into the dim half-light. Mists curled and smoked from dark and noisome pools. The reek of them hung stifling in the still air. Far away, now almost due south, the mountain walls of Mordor loomed, like a black bar of rugged clouds floating above a dangerous fog-bound sea. The hobbits were now wholly in the hands of Gollum. They did not know and could not guess in that misty light that they were in fact only just within the northern borders of the marshes, the main expanse of which lay south of them. They could, if they had known the lands, with some delay have retraced their steps a little, and then turning east have come round over hard roads to the bare plain of Dagolad, the field of the ancient battle before the gates of Mordor. Not that there was great hope in such a course. On that stony plain there was no cover, and across it ran the highways of the orcs and the soldiers of the enemy. Not even the cloaks of Lorien would have concealed them there. How do we shape our course now, Smeagol? asked Frodo. Must we cross these evil-smelling fens? No need, no need at all, said Gollum. Not if hobbits want to reach the dark mountains and go see them very quick. Oh, back a little and round a little. His skinny arm waved north and east. And, and, and you can come on hard, cold roads to the gates of his country. Lots of his people will be there looking out for guests, very pleased to take them straight to him. Oh yes, his eye watches that way all the time. It caught Smeagol there long ago. Gollum shuddered. What? Smeagol has used his eyes since then. Yes, yes. I've used eyes and feet and nose since then. I know other ways. More difficult, not so quick, but better if we don't want him to see. Follow Smeagol. He can take you through the marshes, through the mists. Nice, thick mists. Follow Smeagol very carefully, and you may go a long way. Quite a long way before he catches you, yes, perhaps. It was already day, a windless and sullen morning, and the marsh reeks lay in heavy banks. No sun pierced the low clouded sky, and Gollum seemed anxious to continue the journey at once. So after a brief rest they set out again, and were soon lost in a shadowy silent world, cut off from all view of the lands about, either the hills that they had left or the mountains that they sought. They went slowly, in single file. Gollum. Sam, Frodo. Frodo seemed the most weary of the three, and slow though they went, he often lagged. The hobbits soon found that what had looked like one vast fen was really an endless network of pools and soft mires and winding, half-strangled watercourses. Among these, a cunning eye and foot could thread a wandering path. Gollum certainly had that cunning and needed all of it. His head on its long neck was ever turning this way and that, while he sniffed and muttered all the time to himself. Sometimes he would hold up his hand and halt them while he went forward a little, crouching, testing the ground with fingers or toes, or merely listening with one ear pressed to the earth. It was dreary and wearisome. 
cold, clammy winter still held sway in this forsaken country. The only green was the scum of livid weed on the dark, greasy surfaces of the sullen waters. Dead grasses and rotting reeds loomed up in the mists like ragged shadows of long-forgotten summers. As the day wore on, the light increased a little, and the mists lifted, growing thinner and more transparent. Far above the rot and vapours of the world, the sun was riding high, and golden now in a serene country with floors of dazzling foam. But only a passing ghost of her could they see below, bleared, pale, giving no colour and no warmth. But even at this faint reminder of her presence, Gollum scowled and flinched. He halted their journey, and they rested, squatting like little hunted animals in the borders of a great brown reed thicket. There was a deep silence, only scraped on its surfaces by the faint quiver of empty seed plumes and broken grass blades trembling in small air movements that they could not feel. Not a bird, said Sam mournfully. No, no birds, said Gollum. Mm, nice birds. He licked his teeth. No birds here. There are snakeses, wormses, things in the pools. Oh, lots of things, lots of nasty things. No birds, he ended sadly. Sam looked at him with distaste. So passed the third day of their journey with Gollum. Before the shadows of evening were long in happier lands, they went on again, always on and on, with only brief halts. These they made not so much for rest as to help Gollum, for now even he had to go forward with great care, and he was sometimes at a loss for a while. They had come to the very midst of the dead marshes, and it was dark. They walked slowly, stooping, keeping close in line, following attentively every move that Gollum made. The fens grew more wet, opening into wide, stagnant mirrors, among which it grew more and more difficult to find the firmer places where feet could tread without sinking into gurgling mud. The travellers were light, or maybe none of them would ever have found a way through. Presently, it grew altogether dark. The air itself seemed black and heavy to breathe. When lights appeared, Sam rubbed his eyes. He thought his head was going queer. He first saw one with the corner of his left eye, a wisp of pale sheen that faded away. But others appeared soon after, some like dimly shining smoke, some like misty flames flickering slowly above unseen candles. Here and there they twisted, like ghostly sheets unfurled by hidden hands. But neither of his companions spoke a word. At last, Sam could bear it no longer. What's all this, Gollum? He said in a whisper. All these lights, they're all round us now. Are we trapped? Well, who are they? Gollum looked up. A dark water was before him and he was crawling on the ground, this way and that, doubtful of the way. Yes, they're all round us he whispered. The Trixie lights, candles of corpses, yes, yes. Don't you heed them, don't look, don't follow them. Where's the master? Sam looked back and found that Frodo had lagged again. He could not see him. He went some paces back into the darkness, not daring to move far or to call in more than a hoarse whisper. Suddenly he stumbled against Frodo, who was standing, lost in thought looking at the pale lights. His hands hung stiff at his sides. Water and slime were dripping from them. Come, Mr. Frodo, said Sam. Oh, don't look at them. Oh, Gollum says we mustn't. Well, let's keep up with him and get out of this cursed place as quick as we can, if we can. All right, said Frodo, as if returning out of a dream. I'm coming. Go on. Hurrying forward again, Sam tripped. Catching his foot in some old root or tussock, he fell and came heavily on his hands, which sank deep into sticky ooze, so that his face was brought close to the surface of the dark mere. There was a faint hiss, a noisome smell went up, the lights flickered and danced and swirled. 
For a moment, the water below him looked like some window glazed with grimy glass through which he was peering. Wrenching his hands out of the bog, he sprang back with a cry. Oh, there, there are dead things! Oh, dead faces in the water! He said with horror. Dead faces! Gollum laughed. <laughs> the dead marshes, yes, yes, that is their name, he cackled. You should not look in when the candles are lit. Oh, who are they? What are they? asked Sam, shuddering, turning to Frodo, who was now behind him. I don't know, said Frodo, in a dreamlike voice. But I have seen them too, in the pools when the candles were lit. They lie in all the pools, pale faces, deep, deep under the dark water. I saw them, grim faces and evil, and noble faces and, and sad. Many faces, proud and fair, and weeds in their silver hair, but all foul, all rotting, all dead. A fell light is in them. Frodo hid his eyes in his hands. I know not who they are, but I thought I saw there men and elves and orcs beside them. Yes, yes, said Gollum. All dead, all rotten, elves and men and oxes, the dead marshes. There was a great battle long ago, yes, so they told him when Smeagol was young, when I was young, before the precious came. It was a great battle, tall men with long swords, terrible elves and oxes shrieking. They fought on the plain for days and months at the Black Gates. But the marshes have grown since then, swallowed up the graves, always creeping, creeping. But that is an age or more ago, said Sam. Well, the dead can't be really there. Or well, is it some devilry hatched in the dark land? <laughs> Who knows? Smeagol doesn't know, answered Gollum. You cannot reach them. You cannot touch them. We tried once, yes, precious, I tried once, but you cannot reach them. Only shapes to see, perhaps not to touch. No, precious. All dead. Sam looked darkly at him and shuddered again, thinking that he guessed why Smeagol had tried to touch them. Well, I don't want to see them. He said, never again. Well, can we get on and get away? Yes, yes, said Gollum. But slowly, very slowly, very carefully, or hobbits go down to join the dead ones and light little candles. Follow Smeagol and don't look at the lights. He cra crawled away to the right, seeking for a path round the mere. They came close behind, stooping, often using their hands even as he did. Oh, three precious little golems in a row we shall be if this goes on much longer, thought Sam. At last they came to the end of the Black Mere, and they crossed it perilously, crawling or hopping from one treacherous island tussock to another. Often they floundered, stepping or falling hands first into waters as noisome as a cesspool, till they were slimed and fouled almost up to their necks and stank in one another's nostrils. It was late in the night when at length they reached firmer ground again. Gollum hissed and whispered to himself, but it appeared that he was pleased. In some mysterious way, by some blended sense of feel and smell, and uncanny memory for shapes in the dark, he seemed to know just where he was again, and to be sure of his road ahead. Now on we go, he said. Nice hobbits, brave hobbits. Very, very weary, of course, and so are we, my precious, all of us. But we must take Master away from the wicked lights. Yes, yes, we must. With these words, he started off again, almost at a trot, down what appeared to be a long lane between high reeds, and they stumbled after him as quickly as they could. But in a little while, he stopped suddenly and sniffed the air doubtfully, hissing as if he was troubled or displeased again. What is it? growled Sam, misinterpreting the signs. What's the need to sniff? The stink nearly knocks me down with my nose held. You stink, master stinks, whole place stinks. 
Yes, yes, and Sam stinks, answered Gollum. Poor Smeagol smells it, but good Smeagol bears it. Helps, nice master. But that's no matter. The air is moving. Change is coming. Smeagol wanders. He's not happy. He went on again, but his uneasiness grew, and every now and again he stood up to his full height, craning his neck eastward and southward. For some time the hobbits could not hear or feel what was troubling him. Then suddenly all three halted, stiffening and listening. To Frodo and Sam it seemed that they heard far away a long, wailing cry, high and thin and cruel. They shivered. At the same moment, the stirring of the air became perceptible to them, and it grew very cold. As they stood straining their ears, they heard a noise like a wind coming in the distance. The misty lights wavered, dimmed, and went out. Gollum would not move. He stood, shaking and gibbering to himself, until with a rush the wind came upon them, hissing and snarling over the marshes. The night became less dark, light enough for them to see, or half see, shapeless drifts of fog curling and twisting as it rolled over them and passed them. Looking up, they saw the clouds breaking and shredding, and then high in the south the moon glimmered out, riding in the flying rack. For a moment the sight of it gladdened the hearts of the hobbits, but Gollum cowered down, muttering curses on the white face. Then Frodo and Sam, staring at the sky, breathing deeply of the fresher air, saw it come. A small cloud flying from the accursed hills, a black shadow loosed from Mordor, a vast shape, winged and ominous. It scudded across the moon, and with a deadly cry went away westward, outrunning the wind in its fell speed. They fell forward, groveling heedlessly on the cold earth, but the shadow of horror wheeled and returned, passing lower now, right above them, sweeping the Fenric with its ghastly wings. And then it was gone, flying back to Mordor with the speed of the wrath of Sauron. And behind it the wind roared away, leaving the dead marshes bare and bleak, the naked waste as far as the eye could pierce, even to the distant menace of the mountains, was dappled with the fitful moonlight. Frodo and Sam got up, rubbing their eyes like children wakened from an evil dream to find the familiar night still over the world. But Gollum lay on the ground as if he had been stunned. They roused him with difficulty, and for some time he would not lift his face, but knelt forward on his elbows, covering the back of his head with his large, flat hands. Wraiths! he wailed. Wraiths on wings! The precious is their master! They see everything, everything. Nothing can hide from them. Curse the white face. They tell him everything. He sees. He knows. It was not until the moon had sunk, westering far away beyond Tolbrandir, that he would get up or make a move. From that time on, Sam thought that he sensed a change in Gollum again. He was more fawning and would be friendly, but Sam surprised some strange looks in his eyes at times, especially towards Frodo, and he went back more and more into his old manner of speaking. And Sam had another growing anxiety. Frodo seemed to be weary, weary to the point of exhaustion. He said nothing, indeed he hardly spoke at all, and he did not complain, but he walked like one who carries a load the weight of which is ever increasing, and he dragged along slower and slower, so that Sam had often to beg Gollum to wait and not leave their master behind. In fact, with every step towards the gates of Mordor, Frodo felt the ring on its chain about his neck grow more burdensome. He was now beginning to feel it as an actual weight dragging him earthwards. But far more, he was troubled by the eye, so he called it to himself. It was that, more than the drag of the ring, that made him cower and stoop as he walked. The eye, that horrible, growing sense of a hostile will that strove with great power to pierce all shadows of cloud and earth and flesh, and to see you, to pin you under its deadly gaze, naked 
immovable. So thin, so frail and thin the veils were become that still warded it off. Frodo knew just where the present habitation and heart of that will now was, as certainly as a man can tell the direction of the sun with his eyes shut. He was facing it, and its potency beat upon his brow. Gollum probably felt something of the same sort, but what went on in his wretched heart between the pressure of the eye and the lust of the ring that was so near, and his grovelling promise, made half in fear of cold iron, the hobbits did not guess. Frodo gave no thought to it. Sam's mind was occupied mostly with his master, hardly noticing the dark cloud that had fallen on his own heart. He put Frodo in front of him now, and kept a watchful eye on every movement of his, supporting him if he stumbled and trying to encourage him with clumsy words. When day came at last, the hobbits were surprised to see how much closer the ominous mountains had already drawn. The air was now clearer and colder, and though still far off, the walls of Mordor were no longer a cloudy menace on the edge of sight, but as grim black towers they frowned across a dismal waste. The marshes were at an end, dying away into dead peats and wide flats of dry, cracked mud. The land ahead rose in long, shallow slopes, barren and pitiless towards the desert that lay at Sauron's gate. While the grey light lasted, they cowered under a black stone like worms, shrinking lest the winged terror should pass and spy them with its cruel eyes. The remainder of that journey was a shadow of growing fear in which memory could find nothing to rest upon. For two more nights they struggled on through the weary, pathless land. The air, as it seemed to them, grew harsh and filled with a bitter reek that caught their breath and parched their mouths. At last, on the fifth morning since they took the road with Gollum, they halted once more. Before them, dark in the dawn of great mountains, reached up to roofs of smoke and cloud. Out from their feet were flung huge buttresses and broken hills that were now at the nearest scarce a dozen miles away. Frodo looked round in horror, dreadful as the dead marshes had been, and the arid moors of the no-man lands. More loathsome far was the country that the crawling day now slowly unveiled to his shrinking eyes. Even to the mere of dead faces, some haggard phantom of green spring would come, but here neither spring nor summer would ever come again. Here nothing lived, not even the leprous growths that feed on rottenness. The gasping pools were choked with ash and crawling muds, sickly white and grey, as if the mountains had vomited the filth of their entrails upon the lands about. High mounds of crushed and powdered rock, great cones of earth, fire-blasted and poison-stained, stood like an obscene graveyard in endless rows, slowly revealed in the reluctant light. They had come to the desolation that lay before Mordor, the lasting monument to the dark labour of its slaves that should endure when all their purposes were made void. A land defiled, diseased beyond all healing, unless the great sea should enter in and wash it with oblivion. I feel sick, said Sam. Frodo did not speak. For a while they stood there, like men on the edge of a sleep where nightmare lurks, holding it off, though they know that they can only come to morning through the shadows. The light broadened and hardened. The gasping pits and poisonous mounds grew hideously clear. The sun was up, walking among clouds and long flags of smoke. But even the sunlight was defiled. The hobbits had no welcome for that light, unfriendly, it seemed, revealing them in their helplessness, little squeaking ghosts that wandered among the ash heaps of the Dark Lord. Too weary to go further, they sought for some place where they could rest. For a while they sat without speaking under the shadow of a mound of slag, but foul fumes leaked out of it, catching their throats and choking them. Gollum was the first to get up, 
Spluttering and cursing, he rose, and without a word or a glance at the hobbits, he crawled away on all fours. Frodo and Sam crawled after him until they came to a wide, almost circular pit, high banked upon the west. It was cold and dead, and a foul sump of oily, many-coloured ooze lay at its bottom. In this evil hole they cowered, hoping in its shadow to escape the attention of the eye. The day passed slowly. A great thirst troubled them, but they drank only a few drops from their bottles, last filled in the gully, which now, as they looked back in thought, seemed to them a place of peace and beauty. The hobbits took it in turn to watch. At first, tired as they were, neither of them could sleep at all. But as the sun, far away, was climbing down into slow-moving cloud, Sam dozed. It was Frodo's turn to be on guard. He lay back on the slope of the pit, but that did not ease the sense of burden that was on him. He looked up at the smoke-streaked sky and saw strange phantoms, dark riding shapes, and faces out of the past. He lost count of time, hovering between sleep and waking until forgetfulness came over him. Suddenly, Sam woke up, thinking that he heard his master calling. It was evening. Frodo could not have called, for he had fallen asleep and had slid down nearly to the bottom of the pit. Gollum was by him. For a moment, Sam thought that he was trying to rouse Frodo. Then he saw that it was not so. Gollum was talking to himself. Smeagol was holding a debate with some other thought that used the same voice, but made it squeak and hiss. A pale light and a green light alternated in his eyes as he spoke. Smeagol promised, said the first thought. Yes, yes, my precious, came the answer. We promised to save our precious, not to let him have it, never. But it's going to him, yes, nearer every step. What's the hobbit going to do with it, we wonders, yes, we wonders. I don't know, but I can't help it. Master's got it. Smeagol promised to help the master. Yes, yes, to help the master, the master of the precious. But if we was master, then we could help ourselves, yes, and still keep promises. But Smeagol said he would be very, very good. Nice hobbit. He took cruel rope off Smeagol's leg. He speaks nicely to me. Very, very good, eh, my precious? Let's be good, good as fish, sweet one but to ourselves. Not hurt the nice hobbit, of course. No, no. But the precious holds the promise, the voice of Smeagol objected. Then take it, said the other, and let's hold it ourselves. Then we shall be master. Make the other hobbit, the nasty, suspicious hobbit, make him crawl his own. Not the nice hobbit. Oh no, not if he doesn't please us. Still, he's a Baggins, my precious. Yes, a Baggins. A Baggins stole it. He found it and said nothing, nothing. We hates Bagginses. Hmm? No, not this Baggins. Yes, every Baggins. All peoples that keep the precious, we must have it. But he'll see, he'll know. He'll take it from us. He sees, he knows. He heard us make silly promises against his orders, yes. Mm. Must take it, the wraiths are searching. Must take it. Not for him. No, sweet one, see my precious, if we has it, then we can escape, even from him, hey? <laughs> Perhaps we grows very strong. Stronger than wraiths, <laughs> Lord Smeagol, Gollum the Great, the Gollum, 
eat fish every day, three times a day, fresh from the sea. Most precious column must have it. We want it, we want it, we want it. But there's two of them. They'll wake too quick and kill us, whined Smeagol in a last effort. Not now, not yet. We want it, but... And here there was a long pause, as if a new thought had wakened. Not yet, hey. Perhaps not. She might help. She might, yes. No, no, not that way, wailed Smeagol. Yes, I want it, I want it. Each time that the second thought spoke, Gollum's long hand crept out slowly, pouring towards Frodo, and then was drawn back with a jerk as Smeagol spoke again. Finally, both arms with long fingers flexed and twitching clawed towards his neck. Sam had lain still, fascinated by this debate, but watching every move that Gollum made from under his half-closed eyelids. To his simple mind, Ordinary hunger, the desire to eat hobbits, had seemed the chief danger in Gollum. He realised now that it was not so. Gollum was feeling the terrible call of the ring. The Dark Lord was he, of course, but Sam wondered who she was. One of the nasty friends the little wretch had made in his wanderings, he supposed. Then he forgot the point, for things had plainly gone far enough and were getting dangerous. A great heaviness was in all his limbs, but he roused himself with an effort and sat up. Something warned him to be careful and not to reveal that he had overheard the debate. He let out a loud sigh and gave a huge yawn. <sighs> What's the time? he said sleepily. Gollum sent out a long hiss through his teeth. He stood up for a moment, tense and menacing and then he collapsed, falling forward onto all fours and crawling up the bank of the pit. <laughs> nice hobbits, nice Sam, he said. Sleepy heads, yes, sleepy heads. Leave good Smeagol to watch. But it's evening, dusk is creeping. Time to go. High time, thought Sam, and time we parted too. Yet it crossed his mind to wonder if, indeed, Gollum was not now as dangerous turned loose as kept with them. Curse him, I wish he was choked, he muttered. He stumbled down the bank and roused his master. Strangely enough, Frodo felt refreshed. He had been dreaming. The dark shadow had passed and a fair vision had visited him in this land of disease. Nothing remained of it in his memory, yet because of it he felt glad and lighter of heart. His burden was less heavy on him. Gollum welcomed him with dog-like delight. He chuckled and chattered, cracking his long fingers and pawing at Frodo's knees. Frodo smiled at him. Come, he said, you have guided us well and faithfully. This is the last stage. Bring us to the gate, and then I will not ask you to go further. Bring us to the gate, and you may go where you wish, only not to our enemies. Oh, to the gate, hey? Gollum squeaked, seeming surprised and frightened. To the gate, Master says. Yes, he says so, and good Smeagol does what he asks. Oh, yes, but when we get closer, oh, we'll see, perhaps. We'll, we'll see then. It won't look nice at all. Oh, no, oh, no. Oh, go on with you, said Sam. Let's get it over. In the falling dusk, they scrambled out of the pit and slowly threaded their way through the dead land. They had not gone far before they felt once more the fear that had fallen on them when the winged shape swept over the marshes. They halted, cowering on the evil-smelling ground. But they saw nothing in the gloomy evening sky above, and soon the menace passed high overhead, going maybe on some swift errand from Baradur. After a while, Gollum got up and crept forward again, muttering and shaking. About an hour after midnight, the fear fell on them a third time, but it now seemed more remote, as if it were passing far above the clouds, rushing with terrible speed into the west. 
Gollum, however, was helpless with terror and was convinced that they were being hunted and that their approach was known. Three times, he whispered, three times is a threat. They feel us here, they feel the precious, the precious is their master. We cannot go any further this way. No, it's no use, no use. Pleading and kind words were no longer of any avail. It was not until Frodo commanded him angrily and laid a hand on his sword hilt that Gollum would get up again. Then at last he rose with a snarl and went before them like a beaten dog. So they stumbled on through the weary end of the night, and until the coming of another day of fear they walked in silence with bowed heads, seeing nothing and hearing nothing but the wind hissing in their ears. And we'll finish there for this week. Thank you for coming and see you again next week. Next week, I believe we will uh, have, we will jump back to the first half and uh, I will double check. I believe we have, I believe we have, I believe we have one chapter from both halves next week. So we'll go back for the first half and then after the break we'll do another chapter with Sam and Frodo.